Turn with me, please, to the words that we read in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to be focusing on verses 1 to 6. We read, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the Gospel. Last week, the Gospel Coalition released a short video by H.B. Charles where he was asked what biblical text he would preach on were it to be his last, what biblical text he would preach from were it to be his last. And his answer was John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's a text like Psalm 23, like Romans chapter 8, that many Christians know and that many Christians love. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 isn't one of those well-known texts. It's not one of those well-loved texts. But as we continue our studies in Paul's letter to the Ephesians today, I hope that we'll find these letters to be a blessing and an encouragement. And we're going to look at the passage under two headings. I want to focus on the ministry and then the mystery. So the ministry and then the mystery. First we've got the ministry. Look at verses 1 and 2. Now here Paul draws the Ephesians' attention to his gospel ministry. Now before proceeding, just remember the context. Uh, Paul has spent the latter half of Ephesians chapter 2 speaking about how non-Jewish Christians and Jewish Christians have been reconciled, brought together through Christ as one new man. He has gone on to emphasize that they are they're all citizens of God's kingdom, they are members of God's family, they are stones in God's temple. Here were wonderful assurances for the non-Jewish Ephesians who had been alienated from the citizenship of God's people, who had been strangers to God's covenant promises, that they had been brought near to God, and not only brought near to God, but brought near to each other. And in Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 13, Paul speaks about his own role and how this has come about. And he starts by speaking about himself in verses 1 and 2. And he opens by telling the Ephesians that he's a prisoner. We read, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Paul has already told the Ephesians that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Chapter 1, verse 1. He is a man who was sent out by Christ Jesus. He is a man who was speaking for Christ Jesus. But now Paul tells the Ephesians that he is a prisoner for Christ Jesus. He's a prisoner. He's a man in chains. He's a man who has lost all his freedoms. He's a man who is facing an uncertain future. And he is a prisoner, he says, for Christ Jesus. He is not a prisoner of Rome. He is not a prisoner of the emperor. He is a prisoner of Christ, one who belongs to Christ, one who is under the control of Christ. But he also tells the Ephesians that he is a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles, the non-Jews. He's not a prisoner because of some moral lapse. He is a prisoner because of his faithfulness in seeking to make the gospel, the good news of Jesus and his salvation known. That's why he's a prisoner. Paul continues by telling the Ephesians that he's a steward. Look at verse 2. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Paul assumes that the Ephesians have heard about him. Paul had planted and pastored the church in Ephesus about 10 years previously. He had spent and been spent in uh, laboring and gospel witness for a number of years. And then after three years, Paul left them. After three years of Christ-exalting labor, 
Paul left the Ephesians and when he left them, the elders wept. Wouldn't that be great to see elders weeping because they love their ministers so much? Spangy, Roddy, I hope you start weeping anytime you think of your pastor. But they were weeping because they loved him, because so many of them, so many of these Ephesians could owe their conversions to Paul and his gospel preaching. And now he assumes here that these Ephesians that he is writing to have heard about him. And he assumes that they have heard about the stewardship of God's grace that was given to him. Paul claims here to be a steward. A steward is someone who has been entrusted with the property and the possessions of another. A steward is someone who has been given a task and they will be held accountable for their faithfulness in completing that task. And Paul claims here to be a steward of God's grace. He is one who declares the grace of God, the undeserved goodness of God that is found in Christ. But he is also one who declares the grace of God by the grace of God. God had graciously given him this ministry of preaching his grace. Well, friends, as we consider these verses, we can see the importance of a ministry that is dedicated and devoted to Christ. A ministry that is dedicated and devoted to Christ, that is what we see in Paul. He describes himself as a steward of God's grace, one entrusted with conveying and communicating the gospel, one entrusted with preaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus. But he also describes himself as a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. That is where conveying and communicating the gospel has taken Paul. That is where preaching and proclaiming the good news has brought Paul, incarceration and imprisonment in Rome. Paul is saying here that he has lost all his freedoms for the sake of Christ. And Paul celebrates that. He wears it as a badge of honour. He's not ashamed of his chains. He is not reluctant to speak about where he is and why he's there. Jesus is everything to Paul. Derek Thomas calls him a man intoxicated with Christ. Paul is obsessed. His heart has been captured and captivated by Christ. And if that means arrest and accusation and chains and imprisonment, and even death, then Paul says, bring it on. He is a man whose ministry is marked by dedication and devotion to Jesus. And friends, the same ought to be true for ourselves. Our calling as Christians, our calling as followers of Jesus is to be stewards of God's grace. Those who convey and communicate, preach and proclaim the good news. That is the calling of every elder and every deacon. You are to be stewards of God's grace. That is the calling of every Sunday school teacher, every youth leader, every toddler group worker. You are to be stewards of God's grace. That is the calling of every parent. You are to be stewards of God's grace. That is the calling of every member of the High Free Church. We are to be stewards of God's grace. We are to be those who are willing to convey and communicate, preach and proclaim the grace of God that is found in Christ. And we do this because we are dedicated and devoted to Jesus and would be willing to risk anything and everything, forfeit anything and everything for him. Even our liberties, even our livelihoods, even our lives for the sake of this Jesus who is everything to us. We steward the grace. We convey the grace. We proclaim the grace because Jesus is everything. One of my favorite preachers is an American Baptist missionary called Paul Washer. Now, if you're looking for someone to listen to, I would recommend that you listen to him. He won't give you cute stories, he won't give you clever sound bites, he won't give you a health, wealth and happiness message, but he will give you the gospel. He will give you Jesus. And friends, that is what we need. 
I, I'm concerned when I hear about what some Christians are listening to on YouTube and online at present, where they're allowing their lives, their spiritual lives, to be directed by men who laugh and who joke and who tell stories but give no gospel. They give no real Jesus. And in a sermon called Jesus is Everything, Paul Washer said the following, Jesus Christ is everything. The problem in our churches isn't zeal for missions. The problem is much greater. A lack of zeal for God and the glory of God. When you have zeal for God, then you will have zeal for mission. This morning I want to ask you a question. And it's a question I put to myself. If you were to be put on trial for your profession of zeal for Jesus, your profession of love for Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were put on trial for your profession of love for Jesus, zeal for Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Are you someone who is dedicated and devoted to Jesus? Someone who sees Jesus as everything? Someone who is intoxicated and obsessed with Jesus? And are you someone who is passionate about conveying and communicating, preaching and proclaiming the grace of God that is found in this Jesus and this Jesus alone, even if that means losses to endure and crosses to bear? Are you a steward of Christ Jesus and his gospel? And would you be willing to be a prisoner for Christ Jesus because you are so dedicated and so devoted to him? That's the ministry. But then we have second, the mystery. Look at verses 3 to 6, where Paul draws his readers' attention now to the mystery of the gospel. And Paul starts by speaking about a mystery that has been made known to him. Look at verse 3. How this mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. Paul speaks here about a mystery. Now that word mystery doesn't refer to the kind of detective mystery that we might see in Scooby-Doo or Poirot or Miss Marple or whatever other detective program you enjoy watching. Neither does this word mystery refer to the mystery religions of Paul's day where there were various secret initiation rites and rituals and ceremonies. This word mystery refers to something that God has divinely disclosed, sovereignly revealed, made known. And we'll see in these verses that the mystery is about the full participation of non-Jewish Christians into the people of God. And Paul says here that this mystery was made known to him by revelation. Look again at verse 3. Paul didn't come to an understanding of that mystery through his own studies. If Paul wasn't poring over an ancient manuscript one day, and as he looked over it, he came to a light bulb moment. He came to a eureka moment. Paul says here that he came to an understanding of this mystery because it was divinely disclosed to him. It was sovereignly revealed to him. It was made known to him by God. And Paul says here that he has already written briefly about this mystery. Now at this stage, some people say, well, where has Paul written about this? Has Paul written some letter that we don't possess today? Where has Paul written about this mystery? I'll just jump back to the previous chapter, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Paul had spoken about how Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians have been brought together in Christ. And so now Paul can say, I've already spoken to you about that mystery just, just a chapter ago, just a few verses ago. And now I'm going to speak to you a little more about it. And Paul proceeds to emphasize that this mystery has been supernaturally revealed. Look at verses 4 and 5. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Paul speaks here about the Ephesians reading this letter. He's anticipating the contents of this letter being circulated among the church in Ephesus. Paul's not writing to one person. 
He's not just writing to the minister. He's not just writing to the Kirk session. He's not just writing to the deacon's court. He is writing to a whole congregation and he anticipates this letter being read in the hearing of the congregation. He can't be with them in person. He can't go on Zoom with them. But he can write to them. And he says here that when they read this letter, they will see his insight into the mystery of Christ. Look at verse 4. That word insight is found throughout the book of Daniel, where it speaks about the way that God made things known to Daniel, revealed things to Daniel, disclosed things to Daniel. And here's Paul claiming that he has received a special revelation from God. And that special revelation was into the mystery of Christ. This is the mystery that is about Christ. This is the mystery that sees Christ as central to God's plans and purposes and program for the world in general and his people in particular. And Paul says here that this mystery wasn't made known to the sons of men in other generations. Look at verse 5. The Old Testament contains this great hope of blessing for the nations. And we see little foretastes of that. We see non-Jewish men and women tasting the goodness of God. We'll see that tonight when we look at a widow in Zarephath in the days of Elijah. But the scope of that blessing was never fully understood. It was never fully realized. It wasn't fully disclosed in the days of the Old Testament saints. But now Paul says this mystery has been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The holy apostles are the men who have been chosen by the risen Christ and commanded by the risen Christ to make known what they have seen and heard. The holy prophets are the men and the women who have been empowered by the spirit of the risen Christ to speak into situations and contexts in which they find themselves. And Paul says here that these prophets and apostles, including himself, have had this mystery revealed to them. It was supernaturally disclosed to them by the Spirit. And Paul closes by outlining the content, the glorious content of this mystery. Look at verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Paul writes that this mystery contains three elements. This mystery is the revelation that non-Jewish Christians are fellow heirs of God's future inheritance along with Jewish Christians. This mystery is the revelation that non-Jewish Christians are members of the same body of Christ as Jewish Christians. This mystery is the revelation that non-Jewish Christians are partakers of the same promise of God as Jewish Christians. In other words, Paul is saying these non-Jewish Christians are fully included in the people of God along with Jewish Christians. There is no difference. And Paul knows how that has all come about. Look at the end of verse 6. These non-Jewish Christians are fellow heirs of God's future inheritance, members of Christ's body, partakers of God's promise in Christ Jesus. They've entered into this dynamic union with Christ. They have entered into a living relationship with Jesus. And this means that they're able to participate in all the blessings of his people. And Paul says that they have found themselves united to Christ in a relationship with Jesus through the gospel. The good news of God's grace in Christ. That good news that Paul and other stewards have made known to them. Well, friends, as we consider these verses, we can see this mystery, this unfolding revelation, this divine disclosure of the unity of Christ's people. That is what Paul is emphasizing to the Ephesian believers, these Ephesian Christians. 
he is telling them that they are heirs of God's future inheritance, they are members of Christ's body, they are partakers of God's promise with the Jewish Christians and indeed every other Christian, and it's all on account of their being in Christ, their being united to Christ through hearing the gospel. They are united to Christ, Paul says, and so they are also united to each other. And you know, friends, that is the message for you and I today. Isn't it amazing to be told that we are heirs of God's future inheritance? Isn't it amazing to be told that we are members of Christ's body? Isn't it amazing to be told that we are partakers of God's promise? And it's all on account of our being united to Jesus through hearing the gospel. Isn't that amazing? But this passage is pushing us a little bit further to see every other Christian as being a fellow heir of God's future inheritance. And a fellow member of Christ's body. And a fellow partaker of God's promise on account of their being united to Christ through hearing the gospel. And friends, that changes everything. That transforms everything. Think with me of that Christian who's socially awkward and you don't like being with them. Think of that Christian who is just plain boring. And you do your best not to speak to them. Think of that Christian who doesn't appear to be as committed as yourself. You're in church today, they are not, and you've got no time for them. Think of that Christian who seems to have an opinion on everything and everyone, and you do your best not to speak to them. Think of that Christian who said something hurtful to you or about you, maybe a long time ago, and you long to get even with them. Think of that Christian who has baggage and a past, and who you would never invite into your home. Think of that Christian who has let themselves down and let the Lord down, and you'll speak about them, but you won't speak to them. Think of that Christian whom you had a heated debate with on the Kirk session or the Deacon's Court, and things have never been right since. Paul is telling us here to see them as fellow heirs of God's promise, fellow members of Christ's body, fellow partakers of God's promise. And it's all on account of their being united to Christ through hearing the gospel. They are no different to you. Do you see how life-changing that truth is? Do you see how church-transforming that truth is? Here is a truth that smashes through all the walls and all the barriers of division and disunity and discord that can arise even among Christ's people where we are all being told we are all heirs of God's future inheritance. We are all partakers of God's promise. We are all members of Christ's body because we are all in Christ through hearing the gospel. And so, friends, as we close our reflection on this mystery of the gospel, I just want to ask two questions. Are you an heir of God's future inheritance? Are you a member of Christ's body? Are you a partaker of God's promise on account of your being united to Jesus through hearing the gospel? Is that true of you today, friend? And how are you viewing the Lord's people whom you've gathered with today? Those whom you're sitting beside, or perhaps trying to avoid sitting beside. Do you see them as fellow heirs of God's future inheritance? Do you see them as fellow members of Christ's body? Do you see them as fellow partakers of God's promise on account of their being united to Christ through hearing the gospel? And friend, if you see them in this way, 
then how is that going to shape the way that you interact with them and relate to them as soon as the benediction is over? As soon as you rise from your seat? And as soon as you go into this new week? You see, friends, the saddest thing would be is if the High Free Church heard a message about us all being one in Christ and then lived our lives as little isolated islands or were cutting people off from fellowship and friendship with ourselves. This is a message, friends, that is designed to draw us together in concrete ways, as I said to Sadie and Faith and the other young ones, we have been given two commands from the Lord Jesus. We have been commanded to love the Lord, but we have also been commanded to love one another. And I hope we'll show that over this coming week.